Wonderful Sabbath day, brothers and sisters, and Messiah, Yeshua, the Son of God. Most people call Jesus. I usually refer to him as Yeshua. And I usually refer to, uh, instead of the Lord, I say Yahweh. Anyway, I hope the uh, topic today will make, that's the original Hebrew, by, by the way, but I hope the topic today will make you really think hard and long about the very commonly used word in, in, in many churches today. And in a few weeks, many of you will be keeping the Feast of Tabernacles, or in Hebrew called Sukkot. And on the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath day, yes, when we keep the uh, seventh-day Sabbath here, we attend services, or we go to church, or we listen to sermons, and we fellowship with various other believers. I want to ask you a question today. Why do you go to Sabbath services? What quick answers come to your mind? Write them down. And, or say them out loud if you're in a small group or by yourself even. Just say it out loud, whisper it out. And now for those of you who keep the Feast of Tabernacles, why do you keep the Feast of Tabernacles? The divine appointments, the Moedim with our Maker. In many of the Sabbath-keeping groups, there will be answers such as, well, I go to church and the Feast of Tabernacles because God commands us to assemble ourselves on the Sabbath and the holy days. God commands it. Someone else might say, I go to church and to the feast. And then we hear various answers like to learn to fear God. And there are various, various scriptures that say so. To learn of his way, to be with brethren of like mind, to picture the coming world tomorrow or the millennium, or to prepare to be a king and a priest. And all of these are right answers. All of these answers are fine as far as they go. But now I wonder if anyone or if all of you who said the reason people in the future will be keeping the Feast of Tabernacles will be for one of those reasons. Turn to Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 17. You understand what I'm asking here? Why do you bother going to church services? And some of you, if you're real honest, will say, because my kids can't wait to see their friends, or I can't wait to see my friends. But in Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 17, is a prophecy after picturing the time after the return of the king of kings. And it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to what? To worship the king, Yehovah of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whoever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh, or Yehovah, on whom they will, on, on them there will be no rain. Remember what it's saying here, a prophecy that they went up to Jerusalem to worship. They did go up to Jerusalem, it says here. Now back to my question, why do you go to the Feast of Tabernacles? The prophecy in Zechariah says to worship. Now, when you've gone to the feast in the last few years, have you and your family talked about going there to worship? Or do we end up talking about who will be there, what we'll be doing, what we'll be wearing? By contrast, King David often speaks about worshiping his great creator. We'll see some of that today. In Psalm 29, verse 2, he says, To give Yahweh the glory due his name. Worship him in the beauty of holiness. There is a beauty to holiness. He wants us worshiping him in that beauty. And I want to discuss the word worship today. This message, I hope, will make you think. It might even challenge some of your widely held concepts of what worship is. I hope it does. It might even make you angry at first, because I will challenge long-cherished beliefs you might have about worship. So let's hammer home that people did go, in Bible times, to Jerusalem to worship, and they will be again in the future. Maybe you can't go to Jerusalem, but you consciously think as you go, but do you consciously think as you go to church services that you're going there to worship? Just write some of these down. First Samuel 1 3, talking about the prophet Samuel's parents. First Samuel 1 3 says, Every year they went to Jerusalem to worship. And in their worship, 
they also sacrificed. But they went to Jerusalem to worship. Even in the New Testament, in John 20, I'm sorry, John 12, verse 20. In John 12, verse 20, it says, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. They went up to Jerusalem to worship. That's in the New Testament. Also in the New Testament, in Acts 8, verses 26 to 28, and especially verse 27 in Acts 8, if you have a Bible handy, please, please turn to these. Um, if I move too quickly, it you, would be better if you'd printed out the notes and follow along. But I always recommend you hear the audio and the notes. Anyway, in Acts 8, verses 26 to 28, there it says, excuse me, just a second. There it says that the... Um, the one who had been a deacon and ordained, and probably uh, a full-blown minister by this time, but anyway, he he, uh, he was uh, there was an Ethiopian eunuch that he comes upon in Acts eight twenty six to twenty eight. Now an angel of Yahweh spoke to Philip, the angel of the Lord, spoke to Philip, saying, "Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert," it says. So he, Philip, arose and went. I'm in Acts eight. Verse 27 now. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasury. This was a high official. And had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah, the prophet. And then it goes on to say what happened there. But he came to Jerusalem to worship, is what I'm trying to make the point here. I'm just trying, first of all, in this message today, to make us much more aware that we go to church and be saying that in our hearts, be saying that in our minds, that we go to church to worship. We go to church to worship. Even after Christ's resurrection, note what Paul says in Acts 24, verses 10 to 14. This is now an apostle saying this, Acts 24, I'd like you to read it, verses 10 to 14. You might want to read this one with me. He said he also went to Jerusalem to worship, and that he worshiped God according to the way. Let's read it, Acts 24, verses 10 to 14. And then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of the nation. He's now before the courts. He's, He's trying to do his defense here. I do, I do uh, the more cheerfully answer for myself. This is Paul speaking. Okay. Because you have, you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days. I'm in Acts 24, Acts 24, verse 11. It's been no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Do we speak like that, brethren? And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone or inciting a crowd and all of that. Verse 13, nor can they prove the things which they now accuse me of, but I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, the body of true believers were called a sect, so I worship, I worship according to that way, I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. If you get nothing else from this message, I want you to be sure you're getting this so far. Become much more aware of worship, worshiping, going to services, going to the feast, fellowshipping, and coming before God to worship. Now, the Bible speaks of two two kinds of worship, personal worship, just you and Yahweh or your Father in heaven, and there's a group or corporate worship when you go to services and all come together or go to the feast. That's corporate, group worship. What does worship really mean? Let's talk about that. Okay, We're supposed to go to worship. Now, do you know what it really means? Do you know what it really means? Okay. So that's our next point here. What I'm going to say next will bother some of you. 
people seem to have a very definite mindset about what worship is. And I did too in preparing this. And they mix it up with other words like praise, singing, sacrificing, the way we live, and so forth. And uh, we teach that everything we do is worship. And I, I just want you to really look at this now. In many churches, the worship service is a time when people are singing praise and worship songs. So the reason they call it that is that in, in English, that's what the word worship means, to praise, to worship, to adore, and all of that. And now get this, when the translators translated any word, for that matter, from the original Hebrew into English, they had to pick a word. And they choose the word they choose will create certain impressions and connotations in the translation. Now, I'm going to start with Webster's English definition. I'm going to show you that, that even the, the, the translations we think are word-for-word -word translations really are not. I don't know if there's a single Bible out there that has a literal word-for-word -word translation. There's Young's literal translation. But aside from that, and I don't know if that even always has it literally word for word, because sometimes a Hebrew word or a Greek word uh, can be translated different ways in, in English. Which one of those different ways do you pick? And so that's the problem we have here. But but I want you to sh I want to show you that the English word worship often falls short of the crisp, clean, and simple Hebrew word, and even the Greek word of what it means. Webster's Dictionary says, Worship is the act of showing respect, the act of showing respect and love to a God, especially by praying with other people who believe in the same God, especially by praying with other people. So worship is, is in Webster's Dictionary, uh, combined with prayer, an act of showing respect, and especially in a group. It can also mean excessive adoration for someone. That's the end of the quote. So in many cases, we even have some countries where people and some titles, some, some positions are called your worship. I would never do that. We really shouldn't be calling people your worship. I don't even like being called reverend because the Bible in Psalm 111 verse 9, at least in the King James Version, says holy and reverend is his, God's name. Holy and reverend is his name. Remember, Yeshua even taught us, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed, reverend, holy, be your name. Reverend, holy, hallowed, be your name. Okay? So I don't like to be called reverend. And uh, I don't like calling anybody else in a religious context as father or holy father or anything like that. Are you with me so far? So anywhere, our, anyway, our English word goes all the way back to Old English. That basically meant worth-ship. Someone who was worthy of that worth-ship. It pointed to the worth of something or someone. Now, God in heaven is certainly worthy of our praise, our prayers, our thanksgiving, our worth-ship. Okay? Um, I'm not going against that definition, but here's the problem. The original Hebrew word that is most commonly translated worship is quite a bit more simple and direct than that. What I'm saying is our English word uh, worship has come to mean something quite different, in our heads at least, from the original Hebrew and even the original Greek word that's primarily used for worship. So what is the Hebrew word? The Hebrew word that's most often translated worship in our Bibles comes from Strong's word number 7812, shaha, shaha, something like that, pronounced shaha. Shaka, you might think, but it's 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 a it's a sound in the middle of the word there. Shaka, and Strong says to depress, to lie prostrate in homage to royalty or God. Okay, notice it's it's it doesn't necessarily by itself mean that you're uh, reverencing somebody, but it means to lie prostrate, to bow down deeply to man as royalty, for example, or to God. Now, in the actual King James Version, this one word is actually translated in the Old Testament Scriptures as to bow down, in the King James Version, to bow down, to crouch, to fall down flat, prostrate, prostrate, to humbly beseech, to do obeisance, do reverence, to stoop, or 
to worship. Okay, that one shakha means to worship. The primary word used in the, the, from the, the, the English translator said as worship is simply to bow down, in other words. Bow down before, to crouch down, to fall down flat, to, uh, to stoop down. To, that's the primary meaning of shakha. Uh, now, that's a cultural issue for, the, for, the, for those of us here in the West. As a general rule, we don't bow down or bow to anyone, ever, especially in America and Australia. In England, they, they still bow to the royalty. Uh, but get, get this, I, I don't know that Americans, unless they've been told to do so, taught to do so, would necessarily bow uh, to Queen Elizabeth or to any other royalty. It's just not in our nature. It's not in our culture. It's not in our culture. That's it. So here's the problem. The, the Hebrew word we see in English as worship is simply really the word bow down to. Bow down to. Now, in Africa and Asia and the Middle East, my Kenyan brothers, um, bowing is quite common to someone you want to show respect to. My Kenyan brothers and sisters might find this aspect of worship comes more naturally to them than to us here in the West. Are you with me so far? So what I'm saying in the Hebrew, and even the main Greek word, proskunio, used for worship, means to bow down, even way down to the ground. But when we sing praises and lift our eyes up and our hands up and sing and rejoice, all of that is terrific, it's fine and it's great. And it happens as we, after we're done first bowing down, it's then not technically bowing down though, is it? So sometimes the scriptures will have verses that talk about come and worship and sing praise. Come and worship and sacrifice. So we, we worship first. We bow down. And, we, and, and there's something, I've been doing that a lot here lately, and something is happening to me as I bow myself literally down and consciously do so, not just like you might do in asking the blessing over a meal, but consciously thinking. I am bowing my head. Why am I bowing my head? Consciously think about it. I'm teaching that we need to be we need to have more times of just bowing our head deeply and low before God, literally. But more importantly than the head, although it starts with the outward head, it has to be with the inward heart. What people see is a bowed head, but what God sees, what God sees is a bowed heart. Okay? Of having a bowed attitude, a bowed down heart, or else all of this is meaningless. You can bow your head in prayer. But if you're daydreaming or thinking about that spider walking on the floor or, or, or looking at that child looking up at you, <laughs> and, then, and then you close your eyes because you don't want him going back to mommy saying, but, but mommy, Mr. So-and-so had his eyes open. Um, you know, so we can be daydreaming and not consciously realizing I am bowing before the almighty God, the, the supreme being of the entire universe. Our spirit, the spirit in man, and the Holy Spirit in us has to be bowed down before God. Our spirit in us, the spirit in man, along with God's spirit, has to come before God's presence fully alert, fully aware, fully knowledgeable of what we're doing, and bow down, not just, not just in habit. Uh, you know, even in my business, I, I have to, I, I go through the same presentation in my sales calls, I have to stop before each one for a few minutes and just get my head together and say, personalize this to this person. Realize what you're saying and doing. I know you can put it on like a tape recorder and just go on auto, automatic pilot. Don't do that. Give this person your best. Bring your A game to this. Okay. I'm saying the same thing here. This is really quite important part of the sermon. When you bow down, don't just bow down out of habit and rote. Bow down, consciously thinking each time, wow, I'm before the presence of the almighty, supreme, God in the highest. I'm not saying we bow down in terror or in trembling fear. For per- I, I talked about that in a recent sermon. 1 John 4, 17 to 19 says, perfect love casts out fear. There are verses that talk about coming before him in fear and trembling. But I, I showed you that was an expression to mean an awesome respect and awe. 
In fact, when people in the Bible tended to literally be shaking and literally be trembling in the fear and the presence of God or Yeshua or even the angels, what was the one consistent message from Yeshua, from the one who became Jesus Christ, from the Lord of hosts, from the angel of the Lord, from other angels? What was the one message that they would always tell the people of God? It would always be something like, fear not. Don't be afraid. In my notes, I'll give you many examples. Daniel 10:19 is a real good one. Daniel, don't be afraid. Fear not. Luke 24, verses 36 to 38. They were afraid. And what does Jesus say when he comes in their midst after the resurrection? Also in John 20, verse 19 and 26, he says, Peace, shalom, he would have said in Hebrew. Shalom, peace. Don't be cowering in fear. And there are other verses. Revelation 1, 17 to 18, when John the Apostle literally was having a vision of literally seeing in vision the King of Kings, his Lord and Master. And it is, he describes what he saw. And he fell down at his feet. And what did the King of Kings say in Revelation 1, 17 and 18? I'll have you write that down and you go look it up, okay? Revelation 1. So my point is God does not want us coming in literal fear and trembling. He, in fact, tells us, fear not, don't be afraid, I am with you, things like that, okay? But now do we bow? How much time, how many times each day does, do each of us, does each of us actually spend bowing before Yahweh? For that is the word meaning in Hebrew of the word translated worship, when we're bowing reverently to God. Maybe we haven't experienced Yahweh closely enough to know how to bow or to know to bow and feel his awesome presence so deeply that we quickly bow anyway. We can be too flippant. We can be filled with so much of the desire to learn, maybe to hear the sermon, to sing the praise, to to nod our head at somebody over there we, we recognize that we forget to bow our hearts, bow our spirits, submit it to Yeshua and to God Almighty the Father. We forget, in other words, to really worship. Are you hearing me, brethren? Are you getting what I'm saying here? Now, here comes a real issue. We know we are going to worship God only. When Satan was trying to tempt Yeshua into bowing before him, Yeshua said, hey, knock it off, worship God. Him only shall you, shall you serve, Matthew 4.10. But remember what I said, the Hebrew word shakha means to bow. It's used 172 times in scriptures. But only 99 of those times is that word translated worship. Most of the other times it's translated as bow, bow down, or similar phrases. Uh, because it's actually even used uh, not just towards the bowing down before Yahweh, as, and translated as worship, it's also translated as bound, the very same word, shaka, towards men. Even Abraham, even righteous Abraham, bowed towards men many times. You'll see that uh, later on in the sermon. I'll give you some, some verses. Bear with me. I'll show you those. But do you remember in the book, I, um, I remember, I want you to know I know this, in Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9, as I say that the word also means to bow before men, here's the difference. In Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9, even the Apostle John reactively just bowed down to the feet of, tried to worship a glorious angel. The angel stopped him. But even in the New Testament, notice that the word worship that John was about to give included bowing down to the feet of that angel. You can go back and read that yourself. Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. Down to the feet. If you're, if you're bowing down to the feet of that angel, you're down pretty low. So my take on all of this is this. And the angel, when he saw him do that, said, no, no, don't, do, don't, don't bow down to me in, in the attitude I, I, I see you having. My take of it is this. Bowing before men in simple respect, as you'll see later in the sermon, there are many, many, many times that men, of, men and women of God bow down to their husband, bow down to someone greater position than them, bow down to someone they want to show respect to, that's fine. That is not worship, because worship is a matter of the heart. Worship is what you're thinking in your mind. 
it's a, but what I'm saying here is it's simple respect. I'll, I'll, I'll show you some verses shortly. We in the West would do well to start doing some of that more, even though some might think it odd. However, bowing, the same Hebrew word, shachah, before God, reverently, as we acknowledge and worship him as our God and master as we bow. Now that is worship. If our hearts and spirits are there, bowed down in heart and spirit to give him reverence. Okay, do you see the difference? So you can shaka somebody in respect, and that's not a sin. Or you can shaka God, meaning bow down, and in your heart you're giving him reverence and and awe, and uh, you're worshiping as we think of the English word. But it's the same Hebrew word. So the key is to literally bow, and more importantly to come with a bowed down heart, a bowed down spirit to the one who is God most high, acknowledging him. Him, acknowledging him as number one. You know the old expression, I'm looking out for number one. We all know what that means, right? It means looking out for ourselves. Brethren, we are not number one. You're not number one. You're not even number 1,000. You're not even one number one billion, probably. <laughs> okay, all the nations are less than a drop in a bucket. So we need to humble. See, when we bow down before Almighty God, we're acknowledging he is great greater than we are, and when we acknowledge Yeshua as creator who came and died for me, he's right there with God Almighty, though Abba, God the Father, is the greatest of all, and I'm also bowing down, I'm also shakai to Yeshua, because he also is my king, he also is my God, he also is my savior. I'm putting everything in context, everything in perspective when I do that. That's why we bow down also to Yeshua, who in fact was the creator who spoke everything into existence except mankind, whom he formed with his own hands. Mankind was the only uh, creation I know of that he breathed into, giving us something the animals don't have. We are not animals. We are the humankind made in the image and likeness of God himself, potentially of the God kind, because God breathed into us. Okay, he breathed into us what he was. Okay, so um, the, the YH, the WH, um, the, the H, the H hey sound uh, is, is part of that breath, uh, the breathing, the breath of God into our very souls that gives us something the animals don't have, the spirit in man. Anyway, here's some examples of the kind of bowing they did. When we come to pray before Yahweh, Before our Heavenly Father, we come with a very humbled, reverent attitude. We must come with a heart prepared, not just rote, not just doing it because we've done it for a thousand times. Yeshua taught us to pray, hallowed be your name. Hallowed, holy, special, reverent. Reverend is the name Abba, which is the name we all use in reference to God the Father, dear Father, our Daddy Father in heaven whom we Hallow. We respect that name, Father. Look what society has done to the name Father, to males in general, but to fathers especially. They mock, they ridicule. Daddies in, 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 in the TV sitcoms, commercials, are shown as incompetent, stupid fools. That's Satan, brethren. I hope you understand. That's Satan. Fatherhood should be respected. And the Father of all, the Father of the Father of all of the believers, God Almighty, we come before Him as Father with deep, deep respect for what that position means. Hallowed and holy is the most personal name of the of the highest, Yahweh, Y H V H or Y H W H. It can be either one, the V or the W in the ancient Hebrew. And remember those of the Philadelphian attitude of Revelation chapter 3. Remember, one of the things, I think it's verse 12. Let me look it up real quickly because I'm just now thinking of this now. Revelation 3 and verse 12. It says, I think it's 12. Okay, maybe not, but uh, maybe it's uh, Revelation 3 and verse 8. I'm glad I looked it up. Revelation 3 and verse 8. There it says that you are those who have not denied my name. And because we have not denied his name, he is going to put on our on us the name of his God. 
God Almighty, God the Highest, and the name of the city of our God, and our new name. We do not deny his name. We understand Yahweh is such a special name. We're not afraid to use it, but we use it reverently. We don't speak it in vain. We don't speak it flippantly. But we, we in fact, any, any you know, fatherhood needs to be respected so much more as well, but especially God the Father. Now, here are some great examples of the first way we bow with a bowed heart, uh, with a feeling of awe, reverence towards God, especially when Yahweh has revealed himself in some powerful way in our life, a miracle, uh, just uh, everything coming together in such a way that you know that even what looked like such a horrible situation in the beginning, like Israelites coming to the Red Sea would be a good example. And what happened, you know, in that horrible death trap, God, Yahweh, opened a way through the Red Sea and drowned the enemies, destroyed the power of Egypt for decades to come, When we have those moments, even bad moments, your transmission needs to be replaced. You need bills and and, and, and monies and you don't know how you're going to pay for it. You've been diagnosed with terrible diseases or whatever. And it looks awesomely terrible, terrible, terrible. Even in those times, we praise God knowing that he has the power to reveal himself even more so when times are tough. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I know the people I know who are the deepest believers, the deepest people I love talking Bible to are the people who've gone through the most pain. In their pain, they prayed a lot, probably worried a lot. They learned how to quit worrying, learn to accept what's happening, and they grow. People who have had nothing serious happen in their lives, to me, so often seem so shallow. So shallow. They've never had to fight wondering where the next paycheck or money is going to come from or, or if they're going to live another day or if the pain's going to be bearable another day. In this example, Genesis 24. I want you to turn there. In Genesis 24, Abraham had sent his servant out to find a wife for his son Rebecca. I mean, I mean, son Isaac. And and if you read the whole story, if you're not familiar with it, the servant had asked God to, please, I have no idea how to pick this woman, but show me something. If I, I can find a woman who's willing to give me some water and my camels. He had at least 10 camels with him. And each camel could drink 40 gallons. <laughs> and then Rebecca comes along, young lady, and, and, and offers to. And everything falls together. And he finds out that Rebecca is of the house of Bethuel, which means house of God, <laughs> you know. And, 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 and anyway, in Genesis 24, verse 52, it came to pass when Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth, is what it literally says. In our English Bibles, it says that he worshipped Yahweh to the earth. And I think the King James says, worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. But the words bowing himself, it's either worshipped or bowing himself. The one word there in Hebrew is shakha. He worshipped Yahweh by bowing himself to the earth, is what I would say. In the original Hebrews, the words bowing himself aren't even there. It's simply that he bowed, he shakhaed, to the ground, to Yahweh. Various versions have it that way. The New English Translation, the the complete Jewish Bible, the New International Version, and many, many others. Those versions leave out the additional English words that you find in King James and New King James. He simply bowed reverently to the ground. Now, the, the King James and New King James are just trying to explain what he did. He worshipped by bowing himself to the ground. The servant felt God's awesome presence and felt he had to bow reverently to his maker. Here's my question. Have you and I ever bowed reverently right to the ground, to the pavement, whether in private or or even with a group, but ever in private even, to the carpet, whatever ground is to you, okay? Pavement, ground, dirt. Please get this. I'm not saying we can't look up. I'm not saying we can't raise up our hands. I teach we should raise our hands in praise and worship. But what I'm saying here is start with, start with a head and a heart deeply bowed first. Conscious, when I say the heart, you're conscious of what you're doing. Conscious of it. Conscious of it. 
And then after that, you raise your hands, raise your head, look up into Yahweh's loving arms and face. Another example is in Second Chronicles 7. Before I read that one, I want to read to you something it says in 1 Kings 8. Be turning to Second Chronicles 7, though, if you would with me. But I want to read something first about 1 Kings 8.15. I'll just read it to you. This is also about the same time when Solomon was dedicating the temple to Yahweh. It says in 1 Kings 8.54, So it was when Solomon had finished praying all this prayer and supplication to Yahweh, to the Lord, okay, Yahweh, that he arose from before the altar of Yahweh, from kneeling on his knees, from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. So here he's kneeling and having his hands spread up to heaven. But now look what happened after, after the prayer, this awesome prayer, which you can read of in Second Chronicles 6. When Solomon had finished praying, we're now in Second Chronicles 7, verses 1 to 3. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. Can you imagine if you're one of the scores of thousands of people who were watching this, and all of a sudden, kaboom, this lightning-like fire from heaven came down and consumes the sacrifice and offerings, and the glory of Yahweh filled the temple. Okay, the Shekinah glory just filled it, not just a, a little cloud over the over the ark, but filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of Yahweh because the glory of Yahweh had filled Yahweh's house. And when all the children of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of Yahweh on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and shakhat and worshipped. They bowed their ground to the pavement and bowed and praised Yahweh saying, for he is good, his mercy endures forever. Okay, here they're certainly bowing in reverence, so it's translated in English as worshipped. I want to make it really clear, there's scores of thousands of people here who are now prostrate. prostrate. I work in health insurance uh, form, and, and I talk about prostate all the time, so, so this is the <laughs> prostrate means to lie flat on the ground, okay? To prostrate is something different. But anyway, the Israelites witnessed Yah's presence on this day, so bowed reverently with their faces to the ground. Okay? Um, And you and I have the same opportunity. We don't see a fire consume an offering. But man alive, brethren, we we have the presence of God everywhere we want to around us and and really need to start understanding that. Uh, For example... Um, for example, um, in Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows handiwork. Psalm 97, 6, the heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. So we, we need to understand, you know, there's a song called I Believe that we used to sing in the choir. I believe... Um, there's a phrase that says, every time I hear a newborn baby cry. Every time I hear a newborn baby cry, or touch a leaf, or see the sky, then I know why I believe. Every time you look up in the sky and see the sun, the moon, and the stars, and see a tornado, or see a hurricane or see the fluffy fluffy clouds or see a bird go by the heavens the creation romans 1 says we should know god by his creation okay and we should meet god by his creation just this past evening there was a glorious sunset and after we took a few pictures i literally just bowed my head in my backyard I was by myself in my backyard, and I bowed my head, and I said, Glory, glory, glory to you, Father, who is most holy, holy, holy. And Yeshua, you made everything there is. You spoke, and these t- all, everything I'm seeing came into existence. What a glorious sunset, my King. Wow. I praise you, my king. 
I worship you. I honor you for who and what you are. I see a little glimmer of you in this glorious sunset. Amen. Okay, so we can learn to see God in the creation. That's what Romans 1 says. Again, a few days ago, I was weeding my front garden when an absolutely striking large butterfly with yellows and blacks on it fluttered right up to me. And I couldn't help but exclaim, Wow, Yeshua, wow! Look at you! Look at your artistry. Look at what you made for me to enjoy. Praise you, Yeshua! In that case, then I bowed my head. and I whispered, I worship you, Yeshua. I worship you. So don't wait for a burning bush to appear in your backyard. Don't wait for a loud voice, the sound of many waters, or a whisper. It doesn't matter. Before you bow your heart and worship. Mind you, I did have a burning tree not long ago in my neighbor's backyard <laughs> from a crack of lightning that hit it. <laughs> and that kind of got our attention. But don't wait for a vision before you start really bowing to the ground and worshiping. Every time you hear a newborn baby cry, or touch a leaf, or see the sky, then I know why I believe. Okay, now that's what I'm saying. Are we getting it? Are you hearing me? The best examples of this, where where we worship, are times when they were overwhelmed by miracles, protection, presence. In John 5, verse 14, Joshua is getting ready to go into the uh, to, to attack um, Jericho, probably wondering what his battle plan was going to be, and then he sees this man standing him with a drawn sword, and Joshua's a fighter; he's a man of war himself, and he challenges this man that he saw, and then he was told, and he realized that he was standing before the captain of the host of God, the one who literally became Yeshua. 1,500 years later. And what did he do in Joshua 5.14? He bowed himself to the ground in worship. Would you and I have done the same thing if that had been you and me? I hope it would. I hope we would. I hope we would in our culture do that. To the ground? I wonder, brethren, we may have bowed our heads while standing, but would we have ever bowed to the ground? Would we ever, in fact, though it's not our culture, bow to the ground to worship any time, anywhere, to anyone, or anything? I'm just saying out loud. I want us thinking about this. If God appeared to us majestically in various ways, have you ever bowed your head deeply and started then praising after the worship in worship? Certainly this is why I think it's so important for us Americans, Canadians, and Aussies in particular, if our knees and joints don't allow us to bow on our knees at least two or three times a day, that God understands that. But if we can, let's try the literal bowing of our knees. Bowing down, acknowledging the greater power that, than ourselves, acknowledging the greatest power, the supreme being. Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. Oh, come and let us worship, shakha, reverently bowing, okay? Let us reverently bowing and bow down. That's a different Hebrew word, kara. Let us kneel before Yahweh, our maker, for he is our God. And we're the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. And I'll keep saying it, the Hebrew word for worship primarily means to reverently bow to the ground even at times. If you can't, again, because of bad hips and severe pain in your hips and knees, Abba surely understands at least bow your heart and bow your head the best you can as you sit on your bedside or whatever. But in Ezra 9.5, Ezra was petitioning for God's mercies. And at the evening sacrifice, Ezra 9.5, I arose from my fasting, and having torn my garment and my robe, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to Yahweh my Elohim. Yeah, to uh, the Lord my God, to Yahweh my Elohim. There are times in private bowing or praying and worship, there are times where definitely times we're praying also in a group in front of others. What did Yeshua teach? He says our primary prayer should be in private, where people can't see or hear us. That's in Matthew 6, around verse, I don't know, 5, 6, 7, 8, somewhere in there. So let me state again. Worship is happening when we are so focused on his greatness and majesty and awesomeness 
that we're overcome and we bow our heads and bow our hearts. We're magnifying God the Father and Yeshua. When we're worshiping, we're making ourselves lesser. In talking with a pastor I work with in Kenya, a man named Omai, he said, worship is not something we can make anyone do. Amen. Amen. I agree with that, pastor. It is something that's a natural outflow of a life lived for Yeshua. Amen. But I will also add, and I will add, it also is a natural outflow of a life that realizes the greatness, the grandeur, the majesty, the sheer power, and the love of God Most High, of God the Father, as well as Yeshua. Yeshua is our master. He is your will now. His words are now your words. His desires are now your desires. You are so humbled and submitted to him. You're now his friend and his brother. You're now the son of God. We're also their servants, but we're most, more, more than that is the, the son. But even the son knelt down and bowed. Remember Gethsemane. He is the one we obey, and he is the one we fear, fear to disobey. He is the one we come to broken up in the, the stronger desire to put the sin away from us and repent deeply when we have sinned. And that's all too frequently too often still, I know. He is the one we want to obey and walk as he walked. Okay, So I hope you're getting this thing of worship. In the New Testament, there are so many examples about what I'm talking about here. What did Yeshua say about worship? Read this in your own Bible, Matthew 15. You've got to turn to this one. Matthew 15, verses 7 to 9. Okay? Matthew 15, verses 7 to 9. Matthew 15, verse 7 and 9. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. Another place, I think that's in Matthew 7. He says, they call me Lord, Lord, but don't do the things I say. And they, and they, they're, they're, they're lawless. Okay, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain, all for naught. It's worthless. In vain do they worship. In the Greek here, the word is sebomai, uh, uh, reverence. In Greek do they reverence. In Greek, you know, in, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Where did that policy come from? Where did that custom come from? Why do we do what we do? Where's that in the Bible? Well, they're making certain rules in, in the Judaism as well as in Christianity. So is it possible? To worship our Father in vain, all for nothing. Yes, it is. Yes, we yes we can bow, we can praise, we can go to church, we can go through all the motions. We can tithe. We can cast out demons. We can preach powerful sermons. And I myself become a castaway. Yeshua said in Matthew seven twenty one to 23, read that one next yourself, that this reverence for Almighty must result in obedience, in change. Because he said, I will say to these people, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness, of iniquity. Depart from me, Matthew seven twenty one to 23. And they say, but didn't we... Preach all these sermons, cast out demons, do all these mighty works in your name. Okay, earlier we just read this. These people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips. It's got to be more than outward show. Our hearts have to be in it when we pray, when we sing, when we come before God. And our lives need to be in it. We need to be thinking about who it is we're coming before. It's not just a protestant easy worship that we hear about sometimes. I am talking about a change of heart that must happen, a a humility that must come before God that changes who we are, that changes who we are. We easily put our hearts into a sports context or contest, don't we? Football, soccer, basketball, whatever. It's easy to shout for joy when our team scores a winning touchdown. But what about putting our hearts into praising and worshiping? Have you ever even shouted hallelujah? Hallelujah, praise Yah, that's what it means, praise the Lord, praise Yah, hallelujah, 
This was often times uh, done after bowing. We're told to shout to our maker in joy. Shout to him. We're told to. Told to. Told to. I want you to hear that. Psalm 100, verse 1 and 2. Make a joyful shout to Yahweh, all you lands. Serve Yahweh with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Now we first come with that bowed down heart. And as we acknowledge who and what he is, now we praise and thank and worship. Different words. Different words. Uh, the, the word praise and, and so forth. It's a different word from bowing. So worship. Now let's go to Psalm 29, verse 2. Worship works best when we're in a great relationship with a great God, when we're pleasing to him, when worship is accompanied with the beauty of holiness. God doesn't want us coming before him uh, except in repentance uh, with, with all this soiled, soiled garments. That we, you know, yeah, when you're soiled garments, you're a prodigal son coming home. By all means, come before Yahweh. He will accept you. He will hear your prayer. He hasn't cast his, cast his love from you. There's a party that will go on in heaven if you will but come before him in repentance. And once that's done, Yahweh, our Father, loves to have us come before him in the beauty, Psalm 29, 2, of holiness. Psalm 29, 2, given to Yahweh the glory due his name. Worship Yahweh, or the Lord, worship Yahweh, is what the actual Hebrew is, in the beauty of holiness. Our Heavenly Father wants us coming before Him repentant, cleaned up spiritually, with a heart to obey, to be holy as He is holy. Holy, holy, holy is our God Almighty. To ask for His Spirit to indwell us, to cleanse us, helping us be obedient. He wants us covered by Yeshua. He wants us being transformed. I hope you guys are checking the blogs, because I have many, many blogs. The recent one is about transformation. And, and knowing the great I am that we're coming before, read those blogs. Read them. There's so many good things you'll get there. I think God anoints those blogs. I really do. I think, I think God in, inspires them. Sometimes i got to struggle, Sometimes, but many times on the blogs I just write it out as if God is just telling me what to say. And I, I read it later. I'm amazed. And I say, that wasn't just me. That was God saying that. And um, I pray for that. I pray for that. I bow my head before I start typing. I bow my head before I start the sermon. I bow my head before a lot of things nowadays because I want to bow. Because that's what the original word worship meant, was to bow. Now, some people still think that the best place to worship God is in a church building. Where do you worship God? We are the church. We are the called out ones. We are the temple. We are the building. Are you getting it? We are the temple. We're not just standing on holy ground. We are holy ground. Get that in your head. Really, really get that. We are holy ground. We are ground. We're dirt that the Holy Spirit has come into, transforming us into holiness. For we are the temple of the Spirit of God. The temple was holy. You are that temple. The temple where worship is primarily to take place. Are you known as a place of worship? Are you your life? Would that be called a house of prayer? Is your life called a house of prayer? A temple of God? A place of holiness? That's what it should be. I preach to myself. Family of God, I I never feel qualified to say all these things. I fall so far short myself. Acknowledge that. I'm sharing with you what I'm learning and what I'm feeling. And I hope with what I'm changing in my life. I hope you're hearing it. In John 4, verses 19 to 24, you've got to turn there and read this with me. In John 4, verses 19 to 24, please, please turn there. I have so much to cover. Where am I? I'm nowhere near the end of my notes. John 4, verses 19 to 24. This is about the, the time that Yeshua had said, I must go through Samaria. He had a calling, an anointing from God to, there is a person in Samaria, a woman of ill repute, who feels terrible. Nobody wants to be with her, except the man of the city. 
<laughs> you know what I mean. And at noon, Yeshua sends his disciples into town to buy some falafels or some food of some kind. And this woman comes to the well all by, or by herself. You normally would never go to the well at noon. It's too hot. But she knew no one else would be there and call her names and things. And they have this meeting. She meets the Son of God. And Yeshua tells her things about herself that she realizes this is no ordinary man. And then in John 4, verse 19, it's amazing how many times women women are used to reveal God to us. The woman, John 4, 19, said to him, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Yeshua, Jesus, said to her, Woman, I believe me, the hour is coming when we will, you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. What we, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is. When the time when true worshipers will worship Father in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So he's saying the time has come now that don't feel like you have to be in church building a temple building in a city called Jerusalem, in a mountain called Mount Sinai or Mount any mount that's in, in, in Israel. Okay? Mount of Olives for that matter or anything. The time is coming and now is that we worship him in spirit. Our heart, our heart filled with the spirit in man and God's spirit, working together to bring us to him with a bowed down heart. We bring a conscious self, a conscious heart. We can't worship the one who is light, who is truth, who is love, if we come before him with lies, with untrue doctrines, with unrepented sin. We can come before God in sin if we're repenting. That's the difference, okay? In the Old Covenant, there was a lot of ceremony, a lot of ritual associated with worship. It had to be in Jerusalem. It had to be in the temple. It had to be with priests, on and on. Now with Messiah having come, the temple building is now us. The building in Jerusalem didn't matter anymore. He's actually preparing them for not, not, not to be overly distraught when the building was torn down. Paul says in Hebrews 12, verse 22, that we've now come to a heavenly Jerusalem, to a heavenly Mount Zion. It's open to all who call on Yeshua, with the Jews first and then everybody. Most of the Jews have rejected Yeshua. Any of you Jews who are hearing this, please open your hearts and minds to see Yeshua was a Jew of the tribe of Judah, and he is your Savior. But instead of ritual and ceremony, our Father now wants our hearts. He wants our spirit. I think it can include a spirited worship, as some describe worshiping in spirit. But I think it's more than that. Man has a spirit in man through which we can understand the things of the Holy Spirit when they, God gives us his spirit that interfaces with God's spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that lets us understand the things of God. The spirit of man by itself can't do it. But the God's spirit verifies we're God's children as it works with our spirit. All of that's in 1 Corinthians 2 and Romans 8. We have a spirit in man. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says that when we die, that spirit goes back to God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Not the soul, but the spirit in man goes back to God who gave it. That's why when Yeshua was dying on the cross or on the tree, uh, he says one of his last words, 
into your hands, Father. I commend my spirit. Um, He knew his spirit would go back to the Father. He had finished it. Finished, he says. The original language, he just says, he just says, finished. Did it. So I think worshiping in spirit has a lot to do with this, and not just with having our hearts in spirit but or being spirited, though our hearts do have to be in it. It, it, it. it has to do with bringing our spirit in man, a conscious awareness of our inner self, of our inner soul, when we come before God Almighty. So we are to come prepared in our spirit, in our heart, our spirits awake, alive and well, and ready to be part of this time with Yahweh. It's not rote, it's not quickly muttered prayer that you run through the words like that. In Jesus' name, amen. And you have not uh, presented your heart in a way. Now, you can do it quickly, I guess. You can do it quietly and have your heart in it. But I'm saying do have your heart in it. So Yeshua said to also worship God the Father in truth. Uh, doctrines have separated us. Uh, we don't want to go to that extent that they separate us unless it's on salvational issues. We end up having Bible fights instead of people coming together to worship. They end up coming together to see who can defeat the other's argument. Now, some doctrines are central to to uh, salvation. Those truths you don't compromise on. Bring that truth with you as you worship. Bring your heart as well. Bring your spirit in spirit and in truth. Worship, bowing with your whole heart, with all your heart, with some passion of the right kind of passion that brings spirit into the worship. It stirs the heart. It has soul. It has meaning. But a lot of passion without right knowledge is blown away eventually. We need spirit and truth together. And then that in, 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 in turn will give us the great kinds of joy that we read about in the Psalms and Nehemiah and Ezra and other places. It says in Nehemiah 12:43, the early worshipers shouted for joy as they worshiped God as a new temple foundation was being laid. Those, those, those worshipers shouted for joy. Have you ever shouted for joy in worship? Have you ever shouted for joy while worshiping? Have you ever shouted out alone or in a group? Hallelujah! As you worship. David tells us to. If you'd been back in Jerusalem when the ark was coming back up and David was there singing and dancing, I think that's in... Uh, where is that? Is that is that not in Second Samuel six or something like that? I, I don't have the verse right now, but I think it's Second Samuel six. And David was singing and dancing and rejoicing with all of his heart. Here's my question. You know the story, but here's my question: Would you have joined him in your heart of hearts? The ark is being brought up. The priests are carrying it correctly. And David's out here doing cartwheels and jumping and moving and dancing and clapping and sounding cymbals and shofars are blowing. And he's dancing in the street. Not very royal like his wife thought. Not very reverent his wife thought. Would you have felt comfortable enough with worshiping Yahweh, that way, that you would have joined David. I want you to think about that. Someone also read, sometime also read Isaiah 1 completely. Here you can see and hear and feel Yah's heart. Yah is a um, perfectly allowable, shortened, shortened form of Yahweh. There's several times in the Bible, in the Hebrew, where it's just simply Yah. He is so, sometimes I'll say Yah, like in Hallelujah. We say it all the time when you say Hallelujah. He's amazed how a donkey or goat can recognize its master, but God's people sometimes don't. He chastises them verbally and then pleads with them to repent. So their sins, though they be as scarlet, will become white as snow. In the verses before verse 10, Yah tells the Jews of his day that there was simply too much evil going on. He calls them rulers of Sodom, people of Gomorrah, two of the very wicked cities of their days. Their sins were beyond sodomy. They included greed and avarice, cruelty, injustice, idolatry, and many, many other things that are listed in the book of Ezekiel. It's not just sodomy. It's not just homosexuality. It was a lot of things that made Sodom and Gomorrah cities God had to destroy. He's saying to us, you can't think that you can be evil most of the time. 
or, or ignore me most of the time and then come and act all holy before me during church once a week or on the Sabbaths and holy days and think I feel honored and worshipped. I don't, he says. I don't. Now let's pick up in Isaiah 1, verse 10. I hope you'll follow with me in your own Bible. Isaiah 1 and verse 10. And we'll read to verse 20. Hear the word of Yahweh, you, where again, you see the Lord in all caps, uh, it's Y-H-V-H, Yahweh. You rulers of Sodom, give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says Yahweh? I've had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I don't delight in the blood of bulls or lambs and goats, at least the way you're doing it. He's saying, okay. When you come to appear before me, who has required all this from your hand to trample my courts? He says, you know, that's all you're doing. I know you think you're coming here to worship, but hey, bring, verse 13, bring no more futile sacrifices. And incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies that can endure iniquity and the, and the sacred meeting. Okay, he's not saying, I don't want to have you observe my holy days that I gave you, but don't try to think that you're keeping the feast, keeping the holy days, while you're doing these evil things in your life. I can't endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Okay, get that. It says that right there in verse 13. I cannot endure iniquity combined with the sacred meeting. That's what you guys are doing. Your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They're trouble to me. I'm weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands, that's in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Why? Because they weren't repentant. They were going through the rituals. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil out of the, and the evil doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of Yahweh is spoken. What a loving father we have that he's saying, look, you're going to make me spank you. I don't want to have to spank you with a sword. I don't want to have to spank you with a drought and tribulations and everything. But I will, if that's what it takes, to get you on your knees to understand what you're doing and to change your ways. That's what Cain tried. Cain tried to worship while being evil. He came to worship. And we must come to worship properly and change our lives, change what we are, who we are. So when we present that bowing down to God Almighty, our hearts and, and, and minds have been changed and cleansed. As we worship, let's be sure that we first have repented of our sins and are not compromising with God's ways and teachings and laws. Otherwise, we're like David, who no doubt continued to worship after the sin of killing Uriah and the sin of Bath, uh, with Bathsheba. It was all David's fault. It wasn't Bathsheba's fault. She, too, committed adultery. Yes, I'm not, not minimizing that. But she was ordered to his bed. And God nowhere condemns Bathsheba. He, he condemns David. Okay? Nathan the prophet said, God had said to David that, God had, that, that he had caused by his sins the enemies of God to blaspheme. So God is not pleased when we try to worship and just don't change at all, don't really live it that way the seven days otherwise. Okay. Now, even Yeshua, remember, worshipped by bowing down, kneeling down. In Luke 22, verses 41 and 42, do you remember the time in Gethsemane? Okay, the, the, the Gethsemane means the olive press. And so he was in that olive press situation where he was really under pressure. He was withdrawn from the three apostles he took, the disciples he took with him to a stone's throw, and he knelt down. This is the Son of God kneeling down, saying, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nonetheless, not my will, but yours be done. He knelt down after his resurrection. Now, Matthew 28, verses 8 and 9. After his resurrection, Matthew 28, verses 8 and 9. It says that certain women, uh, disciples, departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to tell the other disciples the word. And as they went to tell him, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped, proscunio in Greek, him. How did they worship him? 
by bowing down to the point where they were holding him by his feet. Would you and I have done that? Would you and I have done that? Let's start doing it now. Don't be afraid to sometimes kneel in public. In Acts 20, verse 36, on the beach at Ephesus with the group, here's Paul. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all on the beach in Ephesus, what is now northern Turkey. I've been there, and he knelt down on the beach. Acts 21, verse 5. Now he's about to leave the group entire. Acts 21, verse 5. And when we had come to the end of these days, and we departed and went on our way, and they all accompanied us, these are the believers in Tyre, with wives and children, till we were out of the city. And we knelt down, we knelt down on the shore and prayed. I'm saying this because some of you are so insistent that we can't do it as a group, or shouldn't be doing it as a group. Uh, that's just not so. If you go back also to Acts 12, in that story, Our private prayer should be private in the privacy of our room, but there are times as a group that we should and we can, and once in a while I think it would be good to all of us kneel in a small group together, in a house church meeting, all of us kneel together and just humbly beseech God and then begin services. I'd I'd love to see that once in a while happen. In Acts 12, and I've given you several examples right here in public out on the beaches, in Acts 12, Peter had been um, uh, imprisoned and was going to be beheaded. And it mentions here that constant prayer in Acts 12, verse 5, was offered up to God by the church. Now, none of this was said when James was taken. James got beheaded. But anyway, the, the, you can read the miracle in Acts 12. And then it says in verse 12, 12 Acts 12, 12, So when he considered this, he came to the house of Mary. Peter is now delivered by the angel, miraculously. The mother of John, whose surname was Mark, one who wrote the Gospel of Mark. They were in Mark's mother's house. Where many were gathered together praying. Gathered together praying. Okay? Would you do that? Would you gather with other believers to pray for someone in deep need of prayer? I hope so. On your knees. In separate rooms in the house and together at times. But be sure to have this kneeling time as you bow, if your knees and hips allow it. Um, Look at what's happening in heaven, okay? Let's look at what's, even up in heaven this is happening, brethren. Uh, Revelation 7, verses 11 to 14. Revelation 7, verses 11 to 14. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures all fair, all fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped, proscunio, I think it says there, worshipped God. My point is they fell on their faces. That's Revelation 7, verses 11 and 12. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Four chapters later, Revelation 11, verses 15 to 17, and there are many other places. Revelation 11, verses 15 to 17, Then the seventh angel sounded, And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. And the twenty four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces, fell on their faces, that's through the ground, and worshipped God saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, and is to come, because you've taken your great power and reigned. Are you getting the picture, brethren? Worship starts with the realization of who God is. And when we come before him, we bow, even to the ground in our room, sometimes in public, at least bow beside your bed, at least bend your head down, at least acknowledge, at least be thinking what you're doing as you do these things. And then everything we do from that moment on is to bring him glory and honor. I have a long way to go on that, but that's my goal. I'm preaching it. I'm trying to live it. And if we're truly true worshipers, we are changing. We want to obey. We don't want to be what we used to be. You know, we're not, not yet what we're going to be. And we're not yet fully what we're going to be and want to be. 
But boy, oh boy, we should not be what we ever were before. We are not wanting to sin anymore, though the flesh is weak, and we still do sometimes stumble. We hate sin now. We really hate it when we fall, when we fail, when we repent. So we repent, and we uh, that's when we repent, and we go in the right direction from that point on. I must remind you again, for the sake of accuracy, just to mention briefly, and I'll put in the notes if you want the scriptures in there, that the word shaka also meant to bow to people. Lot, in Genesis 19.2, certainly bowed down to the angels, to the ground, it says. But he wasn't reverently bowing or worshiping, just showing respect. Genesis 23, it's in, all this will be in my notes. Abraham bowed out of respect to the people of the land. Uh, Genesis 27.29, Isaac here is blessing Jacob, and sometimes nations would bow to him. Ruth bowed herself to the ground before Boaz in respect, Ruth 2, verse 10. Not in worship. That's just their culture, to deeply, deeply respect someone. And and, and it goes on from there, but uh, even the New Covenant, one of the main words for worship, proscunio, primarily means to bow down, uh, as when we're showing um, uh, how in heaven the angels and all the 24 elders proscunio before God. They, They bow down on their faces before God. Okay? So um, once we truly bow down, worship, in that, we will often break out in song, praising, glorifying God. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying to do that. But first, have that attitude of a bowed down heart. So this feast, this Sabbath, remember why you're there. You're there to worship, to bow down in your head and heart and bring your spirit with you. Be aware, be conscious, be prepared in your heart and mind. Bow down your hearts and worship him. Bow down your hearts and worship him, okay? Psalm 32, verse 9. I'm going to read a bunch of these real quick. Be glad in Yahweh and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy. Now we can shout for joy after we start first with a bowed down heart, all you upright in heart. Psalm 47, 1. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of, of triumph, okay? And uh, Nehemiah 8, verse 6. And Ezra, bless Yahweh. Nehemiah 8, verse 6, the great God, then all people answered, Amen, Amen, okay, while lifting up their hands. Don't be afraid to do that. There's so many, many examples of lifting up hands and clapping in, as a public thing as well as private. Don't think that that's wrong. And somehow, uh, you know, some of you who are more conservative, uh, it's fine. It's many, many examples. Moses, Solomon, Ezra, and Paul taught it. Paul said to lift holy hands before God. So is our worship like that? Is it like that? God enjoys being worshipped in a bowed down heart first, but then follow that up in song, in praise, in prayer, with musical instruments, even in celebration with great joy. Brethren, do your own study on how God's people praise and worship. Praise is different from worship. Praise is praise. Worship is worship. And what God enjoys as we worship him. And then don't don't be shy about doing it. God is measuring us, his temple, to see if we're true worshipers or not. So this coming feast, at the feast, and every day until the next feast, think about being there to worship. And we shall not be worshiping in vain if we put our heart in it and if we bring with it a, the worship, the beauty of holiness. We are changing. I have so much to change. I have so much to change. I acknowledge that. But I pray God is changing me. Don't forget the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. And let's do what David teaches as we sing in church, O come and let us worship him. Let's worship with gusto. Let's worship with holy reverence, with our hearts passionately in it, with bowed down heads as we seek to praise, worship, bring him all the glory and adoration possible. As we do, remember, worship results in a holy change. It causes our hearts to bow. Learn to see Abba. Learn to see Yeshua in your daily lives through a sunset, a rainbow, a butterfly, a giant craggy mountain peak. Learn to see him in all of these things. And in those moments, bow your head. Worship. 
and then praise him for his majesty and his goodness. Our dear Heavenly Father, Yahweh, our Abba, thank you for everything you are. Thank you. Let us bow down before you. Learn to bow down. Learn to humble ourselves. Learn to realize you're number one, that you love us so deeply you will take care of us. We worship you. We bow down before you. We bow down our hearts before you. We bow down our hearts before you, Yeshua, our King of Kings.